good afternoon and welcome to the next panel um, that, uh, on, on the political power of data. So we know data as something that we cherish and want to see protected in data protection law because we see it all our individual rights. We also talk about data as an economic asset. Uh, you are, probably can't hear the new oil argument anymore, but data is a very important economic asset. And I think the previous panel has impressively demonstrated that data is also a political asset, and that data can be the source of political power. And I think the last panel was very effective in explaining uh, the effects on voters. So if we see data also as something that is the source of political power, what does that mean for the political power of who has that data uh, and the tools to use that data to convince people? Take, for example, the role of platforms. Again, when we talk about platforms, we often talk about platforms as the facilitators of speech of others. And uh, also in the last panel, again, the discussion came to fake news and what platforms have to do as hosts of undesirable content. What we often forget, that platforms as major corporations are also political actors in their own right, with their own agenda. Take Facebook, 2.1 million users, which is about more than six times the population of voters in the v US. So what is that? What political power does that convey? Am I the only one who is concerned when in a uh, recent interview Facebook's chef in chief claims that Facebook is now more like a government than a traditional company? For the greater good, of course, but still. So this is a question um, we are going to discuss with a very, very, very great panel. And I would like to uh, welcome um, a lot um, First of all, two speakers who have come from very far away. Um, Daniel Kreis, Professor of Political Communication at the University of North Carolina, and one of the pioneers in actually researching the use of micro-targeting in politics. Um, then we have as a special surprise guest, uh, Julie Cohen, a famous professor of law of Georgetown University, who is falling in for um, Julia Reda, who, um, is still at the European Parliament in an important vote, maybe on the new package, uh, what the Commission will do against uh, abuse of uh, data in the elections. We have Stefania Milan, a colleague from the University of Amsterdam, Associate Professor in New Media and Digital Culture. Um, again, one of the academics that I probably don't have to introduce to you, but still, in her project, Data Active, uh, Stefania is also looking at the role of data in politics um, and also on the positive uh, role of the data to empower people. And then we have our moderator, Tom Dobber, PhD student at the University of Amsterdam and emerging expert on political micro-targeting in Europe. So uh, thank you so much for the panel for being here and we're looking forward to um, an interesting discussion. Tom, I give the word to you. Thank you, uh, Natalie. Um, so obviously, uh, Julie has not had the time to prepare an opening statement. Uh, so we'll uh, just move on to Daniel for his uh, three minutes, uh, around three minutes, opening statement. Great. Um, thank you to Natalie and Tom for putting this together. Um, in, in the three minutes that I have allotted, uh, I would, I'm going to talk about the power that platform companies have um, over the political and journalistic fields. Um, so what I'm interested in is looking at the relationship between the tech sector and platform companies in particular and politics, and to make an argument for the ways that platforms have influence over what political actors do, and they shape what political actors imagine is even possible. And one important way that they do so is through data. So a couple of key points, uh, and then we can flesh this out a little bit more in the discussion. First, platforms are arbiters of what voters see. So forms of algorithmic attention shape the flows of political communication. 
It shapes what users can do on platforms. And of course, all this is informed by data that platforms themselves generate to maximize usage and engagement and ultimately revenue of those platforms. Um, this has significant political consequences. So ways in which uh, platforms promote things like emotional content, for instance, um, results in more emotional messages being shared on, on social networks and platforms. In terms of being arbiters of what voters see, they also have content policies. Those policies are both formal and they're informal. Um, a number of folks at this conference have pointed out the ways in which content uh, moderation is interpretively flexible, um, which is to say a platform set guidelines for what's permissible or not. Um, but they also are in charge, they charge themselves with enforcing um, uh, those guidelines. There's also all sorts of informal mechanisms too, I won't get too much into that, but new research that I've been doing shows how Facebook, for instance, will have informal channels uh, wherein people whose content will be taken down can be disputed. Um, they also have internal teams that have active debates over what sorts of content in, in politics should be allowed and shouldn't be allowed. Second, these firms constitute the public itself. They shape the forms and content of discourse. They render the public, quite literally, they bring it into being, right? So um, uh, it is impossible to imagine the public increasingly um, separate and apart from the particular ways that Facebook represents citizens to themselves um, and provides them with infrastructure for them to engage in political and public life. Third, and this is where data comes in really importantly in the political field, Facebook and Google render the public to political actors in particular ways. So they shape the way that campaigns can actually perceive the electorate. One important way that they do so is through data, for instance, that represents the public in a particular way. We've heard a lot about micro-targeting, for instance. As Facebook and Google make certain forms of data on their users available to political actors, they guide the imaginary of political actors to imagine the public in particular ways. Um, on the basis, let's say, of behavioral or other demogra uh, demographic characteristics, um, but maybe not in other ways, such as family relationships, like being a grandfather or grandmother, et cetera. Data shapes how platform companies, uh, for how publics can be known and addressed. Um, they also represent social media publics to journalistic actors through their very functioning. Um, we could talk more about what sources of data are important in this, um, but data underlies much of how these platform companies represent the public and guide political actors. Point number four is that journalism in politics is newly entangled with platform companies. Um, journalism is reliant on platforms for distribution, for revenue, for attention, and even increasingly the policing of the boundaries of the profession itself. Um, so you see a lot about as a response to things um, such as uh, fake or junk news, um, to things like inauthentic actors. Facebook has taken on the role increasingly of working with partners and making their own decisions, sometimes using AI, uh, about how do we verify the content that's, that's out there. Um, in some ways, this is about um, taking on some of the jurisdiction that has pr traditionally been in the uh, tradition of journalism. Um, in politics, and one of the core aspects of my work is to make an argument that increasingly knowledge and expertise resides in firms, services, and the creative uh, offerings of platform companies who actively work with campaigns and often are indistinguishable from political actors when it comes to helping them not only uh, design content but target that content on their platforms. Um, and some of my work with Shannon McGregor has shown how literally Facebook but other social media firms too work very closely side by side with their political campaign accounts. They advise them on data. They advise them on creative, uh, and they help uh, them execute their electoral strategies. This is something that's new. Um, and finally, just as a way to conclude, because I know that I'm out of time, um, 
I think it's, it's key that we sort of also note that at the same time, platforms are downstream of political problems, right? So what we see that's going on on, on Facebook, for instance, with Russian trolls or with the idea of amplifying social cleavages, um, this is something that's also taking place within the two parties, within their political contexts. Um, so Facebook is not a wholly autonomous actor. The ways their platforms are used for political purposes is also coming from larger shifts in the political culture, at least in the US. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, I'm very curious about uh, Stefania's opening statement. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me here. So um, looking at the panel title, I decided to focus on uh, you know, asking ourselves where is power in what you may call, for the sake of brevity, uh, the platform uh, society. So when we think about data power, who holds it and who can perhaps replay it, reclaim it, and if so, how? And I would like to take the perspective of the citizen slash user and reflect on the challenges for user agency, but also for the overall governance in other platform uh, society. I would like to start with uh, uh, what I think is a good news. So scandals like all of the now very tiring uh, debate on fake news, the Cambridge Analytica, all the data breaches that more or less regularly affect uh, the major platforms are bad, of course, in a variety of ways, but the good news is that they are making citizens and users increasingly more aware of the power of algorithms. So in a way, citizens, thanks to these scandals, are uh, becoming interested in the invisible and the gray area of algorithmic personalization, just to name uh, one of the many dynamics that we're talking about here. So I've been studying um, in a way or another what people do in relation to how they activate, how they mobilize in relation to media policy and internet governance, for example, and regulation more in general. And I can tell you that for decades, uh, my main worry has been, well, no one really cares. I believe things are changing a little bit now because people are increasingly interested. Thank you, to, uh, t thanks to this sort of uh, scandal. So in topics that are usually out of the, the interest of, uh, of low interest to the general public, uh, they are uh, becoming uh, much more exciting in a way or another. But then if we look at how can then uh, we channel this uh, new interest or new yeah, curiosity, if, if nothing, or request for knowing more, if not for, for intervention necessarily, we see that we are a little bit at loss. And as uh, Kate Klonick said, platforms are indeed the new governors of the public sphere. Or, I mean, Daniel just mentioned that they literally bring the public into being. But they are also privatized space, right? So they're regulated by terms of services and citizens, of course, and there's no need to discuss this here, don't have much of a say in these terms of services. And yes, our panel here asks what is the political power in the ends, um, whether the political powers are in the ends of private actors task with public function is problematic. Yes, it is indeed uh, problematic. But given there is this new interest, how can we channel, um, channel it, uh, this quest for voice, for having um, a say? And that's uh, the bad news, so to speak. The current governance models, especially when you look at internet uh, governance, fails citizens in their quest for voice in this subject matter. If you look in particular at the widely praised uh, multi-stakeholder governance model, which is anyway a nerdy activity, so to speak. But uh, well, it can very little in the case of privatized space, a sort of voluntary uh, regulation. It's a regulation uh, created and executed and respected by a coalition of the willing, uh, if you want. So what I argue is that the, the current models fail the citizens uh, in a way, in particularly the multi-stakeholder governance, internal governance model, faces a crisis of procedural fitness to address issues and policies at stake when we look at algorithms and algorithms personalization in particular. Think, for example, uh, at the terms of services, uh, of course. But uh, I do believe that, uh, at least for the people in the room, this is an opportunity as well. So th this topic is moving beyond the nerdy agenda. It is now up to us to find a way to channel the, these energies and this request for participation, exercising our imagination and trying to bring up to speed the multi-stakeholder uh, participation model that uh, we, we know to date. So that's all for now.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move on to, uh, to a discussion. Um, I will ask a couple of questions, and oh, please, uh, Julie, Daniel, and Stefania, feel free to, uh, to contribute and interrupt each other uh, if you uh, have something interesting to say. Um, and after that, we will uh, move on and ask the audience um, to, well, we'll open the floor to the audience and see uh, if they have some uh, questions for us. Um, starting off, uh, Daniel. Um, I wonder, these social platforms, they may become more powerful and powerful every year or every month. Um, do they have certain ambitions or goals that they want to achieve? Revenue? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this is a great question um, uh, because I, I think the, the answer is complicated. Um, I think that any pretense that Facebook and, and Google are not um, businesses, first and foremost, uh, engaged in maximizing their, their revenues. Um, and as one way of doing so, pursuing growth uh, around the world, um, I, I think uh, would be in, in error. So we have to sort of start from that premise. That's not to say that these are not both very complex companies as well, um, that also are, are thinking about their short-term versus their long-term interest, um, and also thinking about their role in society. So when I say short-term versus long-term interest, I, I think that in part what we've seen, at least in the, the US context, is because they, they grew Facebook and Google, but here I'll speak about Facebook specifically, because they grew so fast, um, their role in politics generally evolved pretty accidentally. Um, they developed their political operations, their ad sales, for instance, or their account management downstream of their commercial advertising. Facebook never stopped to think along their history um, that selling soap would be different than selling a candidate. Therefore, they took their commercial advertising services and stood it up pretty much without change in the political space. This is what led to all the problems that we saw in the US, at least in 2016, although the, the symptoms were there before in, in 2012 when candidates such as Barack Obama were using Facebook's API uh, to engage in things like micro-targeting. The problem is, and Joe Turo and I did a conference after the 2012 election called Data Crunch Democracy where we tried to raise these issues with data security and privacy. Obama won so nobody cared. That's the reality of it. Donald Trump wins in 2016, and all of a sudden we have a very different conversation in the US. So um, I think because of that accident, um, they stopped to think about, well, we can't pursue the same sets of strategies. We have to think about our long-term growth. We have to think about the danger of the threats of regulation so that you know, they have to evolve models of self-regulation to try to stave off uh, public regulation. I think we've seen a number of voluntary initiatives. I will say too, and I guess this is probably my final, my final point, is that I spend a lot of time talking to various um, and differently situated representatives uh, and employees within Facebook. And it, it is a large, very complicated multinational corporation. There is no one Facebook strategy. There are many different actors who have many different agendas and many different arguments that they're making internally for what Facebook can and should be. There's a clear hierarchy and chain of command that Mark Zuckerberg sits on top of. However, there are a lot of people who work in politics and other spaces who do take things like um, uh, privacy, voter privacy, uh, very seriously, who have made arguments in the company that they need to do more in some cases, less in others. Um, so, so these things are all part of how the company evolves. Um, and I think that, that because of that, you see um, some initiatives get advanced that might not be in their immediate uh, you know, sort of bottom line interest, um, but that might have you know, beneficial democratic consequences, even as you also see in other corners of the company just stunning failures, like the story today, I mean, there's one every day, um, about you know, the company paying, paying teens $20 um, to, to you know, basically take possession of their mobile phones and, and track their lives. So um, I would say that, that it's, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, Julie? So um, 
So I want to make, regard, regarding your question what they want, um, I want to make three kind of disconnected points, which can be in lieu of the opening statement that I didn't have. Um, so number one, what their, what their interest, right, is their own unimpeded field of action and what they want, um, because it is a revenue maximizer, is to, um, is to in, the, in the content space, they want to kind of amplify volatility, right? They want to amplify outrage, amplify virality. Um, and it's important to understand that even though many of you in this room and many of us up here just sat through a, a prior discussion on micro-targeting, that um, you don't need to do micro-targeting to do the other thing I just said, right? Because people share within their networks, all you have to do is piss them off enough. Um, so so there's a... There's a tendency, um, because every privacy and data protection person is kind of secretly, at least in part, a conspiracy theorist to say, ooh, it's all micro-targeting. No, not really, right? Um, but, but, but amplifying virality and volatility will get you revenue, and it doesn't really matter if, um, you know, in terms of Cambridge Analytica in particular, the delta is really small, as long as you catalyze the viral sharing. Okay, so that's point one. Point two, right, back to the what they want is their own unimpeded field of action. This is no different really than what any large transnational corporation wants, but what it translates into kind of um, processes of legal institutional entrepreneurship to kind of smooth the way, right? And so again, kind of outside the field or this frame of reference of many data protection discussions, although at least if um, Christina and Svetlana are in the room, not completely outside the field, right, um, is um, kind of machinations in the trade governance realm, right? If you don't like the, um, the regulatory discussion that's going on, for example, in the, in the domain of data protection, you regime shift um, into some other domain where you can perhaps produce a more congenial result. Um, transnational corporations in general are quite nimble at that because they have the reach and the resources. Um, platforms over and above that have the discourse, right, which they're directly mediating. Um, but it's important to kind of take that in. Um, okay, third disconnected point. Um, Let's try really hard to put in this space not just what a Facebook and Google want, but what a WeChat and Alibaba want. Um, because I promise you the answer is at least partly different, right? Um, if you situate, if you ask what does WeChat want um, and you take into consideration their perfect score of, I think, zero from Human Rights Watch on, um, on backdoor access uh, to state actors, right? Um, what they want is to be, you know, a virtuous corporate citizen in partnership with state sovereigns that have an interest in direct, um, more authoritarian modes of surveillance. And they're contesting the space of virtual messaging and everything else with Facebook. Um, and I'm not here to carry water for Facebook, right? So I'm not trying to make you think, oh, poor Facebook, they're, they're contesting for market share with WeChat. Um, I, I just want you to take that on board because it, it complicates the, um, the field of action rather substantially. Um, you have to look globally now at what platforms want, and, and in asking that question, it's not just Facebook and Google. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what we see here is that Facebook, but also other large uh, social platforms, have a lot of information about people, but also offer the ways to political party to reach those people. Um, Stefania, um, do you think that maybe there comes a point that maybe um, social platforms become too powerful? Can I adjust the order here and just add something to what was being discussed? And then maybe I can get yeah. that one. And uh, just to what uh, my colleagues here just, uh, just said, I would like to add the perspective or a critical reflection, if you want, on the perspective of the civil society, which is committed to you know, making all the world a better place also through promoting uh, digital rights. 
And uh, what Daniel said, that uh, the company is very complex and there are conflicting agendas, but that also it's, it's a company, therefore, as it is the nature of these organizations, is trying to maximize profits, it's also something that, that Julie reiterated uh, quite well. Well, um, you know, at the same time, so this is the reality of social media corporation, but uh, this doesn't necessarily translate very well in uh, the reality of social media organizations that work on digital rights. And, uh, well, sometimes, often, actually, the understanding of the activist um, simplifies, oversimplifies uh, the company, makes it a bit monolithic, fails to distinguish the various um, agenda, but also uh, activists sometimes attribute features and intention to the company that does not necessarily uh, correspond to reality, like the fact that uh, you know, um, Facebook should or want uh, to promote uh, human rights through uh, its platform. And uh, attributing it's another agenda, other goals other than the revenue, uh, activists end up spending a lot of time uh, trying to make sure that Facebook, for example, can be a value call to, enforce, uh, to promote human rights for exercising human rights, but also and this is another attitude that you said, the activists spent a lot of time trying to make sure that social media companies themselves enforce human rights in their doings. There's nothing wrong with this. I'm just wondering whether um, all these efforts are well placed, considering what uh, we just heard, right? These are private companies who might occasionally uh, portray themselves as uh, uh, democratic agents, democratic players in, in, in democracy, and you know, it, it is a good selling point. And I don't want to doubt any good intention of Mark Zuckerberg or whoever is, is, is deciding. But we might risk a civil society spending a little too much time and energies in trying to read too much into these uh, purported agendas uh, when these agendas, in fact, are not exactly then uh, translated into practice. So this is just to add, uh, you know, the perspective of the grassroots, if you want, when it comes to reading the intentions and the goals and, uh, and the function of social media platforms in our society. And then now, uh, I forgot your question, so maybe I want to, <laughs> to ask it again, and then we can move on to that point, unless my colleagues here have something to say. Um, I was actually... Um I triggered by something that, uh, that, that Julie said about uh, the, the immense uh, number of data that's also being collected in, in China, which is maybe a bit of, uh, of course, a very different context from the context that we usually uh, talk about. Move your mouse farther away from the mic. Ah. There's a big echo. Okay, so Thanks. again. So um, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, China. Um, because indeed, uh, Julie, as you say, there is a lot of uh, data collected and there is a lot of um, people who are being maybe surveilled in China and there is a very large infrastructure of surveillance there. And uh, Daniel or Julie, um, do you know if there is research on China where these, um, these WeChat and these so Chinese social platforms are being used for political goals, for influencing elections, for instance? Well, um, I can't speak to Chinese elections, um, and I'm not, I can't pretend to be an expert. There is certainly some research clearly indicating that um, that platform, um, private platforms are kind of doing double duty to some extent um, as partners in state surveillance initiatives. Um, and I guess the thing I want to say about that is um, if you think that's just China, you would be wrong, right? So, so um, the, uh, the last time I gave a presentation in Israel and I was using Amazon as an example, somebody in the front row goes, what Amazon, what Amazon? We get everything by AliExpress here. Um, there's... Um, the, as a part of kind of, or as a counterpart to the Belt and Road um, initiative, there's um, everywhere you have in the global south um, populations that are being brought directly online via mobile, right? Um, and you don't have to give them a chip and pin card to make them happy about their data security because they've never had a credit card anyway, but you can give them mobile payments, 
Um, they're going straight to mobile, right? And very often the provider is WeChat, right? Or the provider is AliExpress. Um, so we're talking about um, all of Asia, right? Or all of South Asia, um, because Korea and Japan are, are different again, right? Um, we're talking about Latin America, we're talking about Africa, we're talking about the Middle East. Um, so, so the point was just to say there is actually kind of a global contest for market share that Facebook and Google are players in, but not the only players in, and it's just worth remembering that. Yeah. Um, what is, I guess, it is something that we've talked about also in the, the previous uh, panel a little bit, or we circled around it maybe a bit, but in my opinion, maybe the million dollar question is, can a social platform, Daniel, can a social platform be decisive in an election? <laughs> and how? Um, so there's, there's obviously a lot of, of debate about this in the, in the social sciences. Um, it is how much can we attribute, for instance, um, Trump's victory uh, to Russian meddling uh, in the US election um, or cyber war, to use the words of, of Kathleen Hall Jameson. Um, my own view on this is that we can never disentangle what happens on Facebook from what happens across the millions of other messages that the public sees across many different platforms, um, many different forms of media in the context of their, uh, of, of a political campaign. Um, the evidence that we have, uh, I think, on, on this is, is mixed. We know there was a, a wonderful discussion last, um, during the last panel about when media have effects. Um, particularly in a high salience, a very polarized uh, election, you're not going to change many people's minds. Um, uh, at best, I think the, um, uh, the effects you might have is to make people less enthusiastic to vote for your particular candidate. Um, but I'll give you one example of how complicated this is. Um, you know, when we talk about things like, like uh, voter suppression, um, which are like hyper-targeted ads uh, to um, particularly small slices of the electorate designed to make them less likely to vote, um, as some people use the term. I prefer demobilization. Voter suppression has a, a very different context in the US, uh, particularly in the American South. Um, but when you think about those types of, of demobilizing ads, uh, the, the thing is is that both campaigns and many other actors engage in these forms of negative advertising as a matter of course. Um, so sitting in North Carolina, I can tell you I would see uh, targeted Hillary Clinton ads that were portraying Donald Trump as being unfit to serve the country, which I happen to agree with, uh, let me say that. But they were hyper-targeted and they were aimed at, at Republicans. Um, they were aimed at suburban Republicans in particular to make them less likely to go ahead and vote at the, at the election. So I think we need to have a, a very deep conversation about what is, what is ethical campaign practice, what's above board and, and what's below board, um, what should guide the use of data in this, in this space, quite apart from the question of outcomes. I think we need a more robust conversation from the practitioners and the platforms themselves about the sorts of ways platforms can and should, uh, in accordance with good democratic practice, be used in the, in the context of, of an election. Um, I don't think anyone knows exactly what the effects are of, of, of uh, the Russians, of hyper-targeted ads um, uh, from 2016. I think there will continue to be a lot of debate, um, particularly when you have messaging from the president himself that was speaking in racially inflammatory ways and making bald appeals to white voters uh, from the stage, and that was being amplified in, in, in micro-targeting, but Trump had no problem saying that to an undifferentiated and broad audience, and he continues to do so. So I think disentangling those things are, are challenging as a social science perspective. Yeah, and I find it very interesting that you also say um, we, need to, we need a conversation together with practitioners and we need to establish maybe new, new normative uh, rules about, uh, about this. But what I wonder is, I'm sure uh, commercial uh, micro-targeting, that's, that's, I guess that's easy to, to do something about because uh, politicians themselves, um, I mean, they don't lose any uh, 
um, campaigning technique if they regulate it, if they would uh, do something about um, uh, political micro-targeting, then they might uh, regulate the exact thing that got them into office. So how realistic is this, uh, such a debate? Yeah, so, I mean, just, just briefly, Etan Hirsch has a great book called Hacking the Electorate, where he makes the, the basic point that all the data that's very valuable to politicians, politicians themselves make available to themselves. Um, and in the US context, at least, it's actually not data coming from Facebook or Google. Um, that's of primary value. It's the data that comes from the parties themselves um, and that is linked to other forms of commercial marketing data sets. So for instance, campaigns can do far more um, than what Google would let them do when it comes to hyper-targeted advertising. Facebook is primarily valuable because of custom audiences, because campaigns can bring their own pre-existing data sets that the parties have to their ad platform and serve up ads to people that they've identified. Facebook doesn't have data anywhere near as good as any of the two US political parties um, for all sorts of, of um, complicated reasons, but the basic fact is, is because a lot of that relies on the historical data that the two parties have collected over the last 30 years. Um, uh, and some cases even before. So um, to your question, I mean, I think it really, the, the, it comes down to at the end of the day, you have to think in a very nuanced and comparative sense about what data is important, why and, and when. Um, it's also why I do think that, that putting pressure on politicians for the things that they ordinarily decry, but then we'll turn around and their campaigns would be running these hyper-targeted ads, often without disclosure and transparency. We have to keep up that public pressure. Thank you. Um, Stefania, you are um, uh, the expert of uh, activism on platforms, but um, a way in which platforms express their, their power um, is also by um, activism of themselves. Uh, an example of this, maybe a bit of an abstract thing, is uh, Uber, uh, who in uh, New York, uh, Mayor de Blasio wanted to um, regulate Uber, some, something unfavorable for them. And what they did was they, um, they really uh, went to their app users and offered them free rights to protest against uh, the mayor. Um, and uh, they, they um, adjusted their app to, to, see, uh, to let the, um, the users see what would happen if uh, de Blasio would actually carry out uh, his plan to regulate Uber. Um, so this is really activism of platforms. <clears throat> um, do you know how persuasive such efforts are? That's a very big question. I guess there's definitely a contextual uh, answer. I mean, uh, Uber applies, or, or it, let's say, um, it's um, is interesting to a certain uh, range of the population with very concrete needs. Uh, maybe when you you go for some kind of uh, you know more social networking platforms, you have to find better ways. So you don't have this kind of easy way of appealing to to customers and, and making them realize what they might. Uh, they might lose. So, well, definitely platforms, precisely because they are powerful actors, precisely because they are extremely diverse uh, in, their, in their functioning, but also because they have a very clear agenda uh, to pursue, they might engage in a variety of tactics, pretty much like activists will do, right? And in that sense, uh, they, they're definitely smart at doing that. They have also the ability to leverage, for example, drivers, like in the case of Uber, uh, to enforce them to do something um, by, I guess, compensating them. I don't even know how that really worked in practice. I, I only uh, followed this, um, uh, this, this situation from far away. But these are strategies that are not available necessarily to activists themselves because they are typically far less powerful actors with very uh, limited resources, especially if we look at uh, financial resources. So this is a very interesting... Um, game where you have like so to simplify three poles you have users you have uh you know say governments the regulators and then you have uh companies and in a way or another they're all playing out their their tactics and their strategies and um, their strategies sometimes are aligned like in the case of, of uber you have uh, you know the goals of the company that uh, that meets a list if not it, the agenda might not be aligned with one of the users, but it meets the users when in their needs, right? Give away free stuff and people are gonna be uh, very happy. And uh, you have other still powerful actors like the regulators who might find uh, it very difficult to explain the citizens, to the citizens that they are just doing it for, for their own sake, right? 
So uh, it is complex and it is uh, dynamic, it's very contextual, and I guess it also changes very much according to the geography and the type of platform they're looking at. Yeah. And, and to where, uh, so you want to say something? I just want to add on, so, um, so that's totally right, um, but there are, it's important to recognize that um, that that's just kind of one part of the legal entrepreneurship, right? So resisting direct regulation is kind of easy to see. Um, when you are, you know, um, funding smart city experiments or autonomous vehicle experiments um, kind of directed at disintermediating public transit, that's another kind of entrepreneurship that has to be kind of taken on board. So, um, so you have transit systems, at least in, I'm not as familiar with the European cities, but in the, in the major US cities, um, ridership has dropped, right? And, and the transit systems are in trouble from a revenue perspective. And at least some of that certainly is their fault because they don't maintain their infrastructures. Um, but it's also, I think clear that at least some of it is the fault of the um, of the alternatives. Um, so there's a whole discussion now we could have about about the provision of transit services, right? But that's a that's a kind of entrepreneurship that's um, that's sort of diffusing through the space of every service you could imagine, all the way to dispute resolution, right? So every thing um, that is happening in the EU around, um, you know, quick removal of terrorist speech um, formally takes the form of a legal mandate but is operationalized through the, um, the private con content moderation processes of the platforms. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of insertion into the space of dispute resolution also, and that's a kind of legal entrepreneurship also, and it's pervasive. Um, so yes, and more, and more, and more. And it is, in a way, the, the good old story of um, the different power in the game, right? Yeah. So there's nothing new in that respect, except that probably the repertoire of, let's call it activism, lobbying, intervention, has expanded. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but we still have you know, citizens who are, in a way or another, far less powerful than, than the others, and states as well. Um, Julia, Reda, thank you for, for being here. You had a vote. Uh, I'm very happy that I you still you, made it. Sort of. uh, we, have a, we have a stand in Julia. <laughs> She's called Julie. <laughs> um, so we've talked already a little bit about the power of, of platforms. So I, um, I'm especially happy that, that you're here as a, as a member of the European Parliament and with the European Parliament elections approaching. Uh, very curious. Uh, what does the European do to, uh, to address the political power of platforms in this uh, nearing election period? Yes. Um, first of all, I apologize for being so outrageously late. We uh, had a very important vote uh, to have a debate on our own rules in the parliament, which uh, luckily we won. So. Uh, I apologize uh, for being late for that. I think um, uh, in the European Parliament where uh, a consensus has emerged, and I think this is no longer really a discussion, is that we do need platform regulation uh, from the side of the state because uh, social media have an important uh, uh, role to play and have gained significant power. But uh, what I find quite uh, dangerous in the types of legislation that we have seen so far is that quite often they rather reinforce the uh, power of platforms, for example, by institutionalizing uh, the removal of content on the basis of terms of service like we have in the terrorism regulation, which at the end of the day still means that the decision about what is considered <laughs> acceptable and what is not is done by the platform and not by the, the legislator. Um, on the elections in particular, we are uh, having a discussion that is very much focused on outside interference in the elections, which is an important topic, but uh, I think we also have to discuss more about uh, the, the effect that micro-targeting on platforms uh, such as Facebook in particular has on how political discussion is happening in general. So, of course, it is uh, a, an important issue to fix if you have uh, outside sponsors of uh, advertisement uh, that could uh, influence the outcome of a referendum or of an election. But it's also a problem if political parties increasingly 
uh, communicate quite differently to different audiences and that the specific message that is being sent to people is adapted to their specific demographics or uh, presumed opinions. Because I think we as voters also have a right to know what exactly a political party stands for and not to have their message tailored to what they think we want to hear. And um, in, in that regard, uh, unfortunately, there is not a lot of progress. We know that from the side of Facebook, uh, the uh, publication of uh, advertisements regarding elections um, is supposed to also be rolled out uh, in the EU. But uh, this, uh, where this already exists, like in the US, we know that these platforms uh, or this particular way of looking at what advertisement is out there is incomplete and quite a lot of important data is missing. And I think our responsible as reg uh, responsibility as regulator is not to just trust the platform, in this case Facebook, to provide all the relevant information themselves but to give access to third parties, to researchers, uh, which is rather on the decline. Um, so I think this is something that should be mandated by law, but unfortunately the types of platform regulation that we see at the table uh, at the moment are rather going in the opposite direction of giving the platforms more power over deciding what we see rather than regulating it and making sure that it's non-discriminatory. So why is it moving in the opposite direction? I think there, there are a lot of reasons for this, and it's not a very simple uh, uh, question to answer. Um, I think there is a, a push for uh, having these types of uh, decisions in the terrorism uh, area and the terrorism regulation because it's extremely difficult to get all of the European countries to agree on what illegal terrorist content actually is. And you can sort of sidestep by that problem by saying, well, we're not going to agree. Instead, we're going to have Facebook decide it for us. But I think this is uh, also uh, shirking our responsibility as legislators, because at the end of the day, the reason why we can't agree and have an exactly the same rules for what is considered uh, criminal terrorist content and what is not uh, is because it's very important and it has an important uh, impact on freedom of expression. And uh, simply delegating that decision to a private company is not going to make this decision any more dif uh, difficult. So I think this is one reason why it is happening. Another reason is, of course, because the platforms themselves have gained a certain political power and lobbying power that allows them to influence what kind of legislation is proposed. And finally, there are also interests that have very little to do, I think, with uh, the, the problem of election interference, uh, in particular, such as uh, players of the entertainment industry who have an interest to, to push similar poly policies in the copyright directive. So all of these factors are rather uh, leading to, to uh, less legislation that would actually uh, hold platforms accountable and instead leading to more automated content moderation uh, to satisfy either business interests or uh, to, to find a work around the difficulty of finding pan-European solutions. So um, one last question before we uh, move over to the uh, audience um, is something I, I'm, I'm very curious about. When I saw that uh, Google News uh, threatens to leave the EU market over, um, over Article 11, um, Google basically uses its, its power as an enormous company to, to pressurize the, uh, the European Parliament. Um, how do you, as a uh, member of the European Parliament, respond to such uh, threats? Well, on this particular point, I have to say that Google has a point, which may surprise you considering everything else I have said so far. But uh, what we are talking about here is a proposal coming from uh, one large German press publisher in particular, following which the linking to news articles and reproducing the headline of a news article would cost money. And this would actually violate uh, international copyright treaties that say the facts of the day, the news, should never be copyrighted. But if this is the case, if we assume that this law gets passed and you do have to pay money in order to have the privilege to link to a news article, well, then it's in the right of any company to say, well, we are not going to pay for that service and stop linking to it. 
So I think it, it, it's not really a question of, of using market power to pressure somebody. I think in this case, Google is simply exposing what the effect of this law would be. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite the audience to the microphone if they uh, want to ask something. Okay, I've, ah, now it works. Uh, so a question to, to uh, Daniel Kreis. You spoke about how the platforms kind of, as I understood, monopolize information about the electorate, about uh, political campaigning techniques, and seem to kind of shape how parties perceive the electorate. How is this different from what um, political campaigning consultancies conventionally do? Um, on the level of effects or, or anything else? Thanks. Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. So, so to jump into it in a little bit more of a nuanced way, um, both Facebook and Google set the rules around which um, political actors or any other actor um, can appeal to some audience, right? They determine on what basis they can be targeted. They determine um, ultimately what the permissible content to target somebody with is. They set the guidelines around those things. Um, as I said before, they're, it's remarkably interpretive on the company's part. Um, Tarleton Gillespie wrote a great book called Custodians of, of the Internet, where he sort of delves into all the ways in which content moderation guidelines leave a lot of room for companies themselves to have flexible policies that can be developed in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the other thing that both Facebook and, and Google do um, broadly is they control uh, the what people see. Um, they do so through the algorithms that guide the platforms themselves. As a number, as, as uh, Julie mentioned earlier. Um, they reward certain types of content over others um, because they want to maximize engagement and ultimately revenue on their platform. So um, what people are going to be more likely to interact with happens to be emotional content, happens to be polarizing identity-based appeals. Um, that is the content that they reward. Now, what's different about what political consultants do themselves? So first of all, they... In the online ad space, as, as surprising as this might be to some people, um, campaigns actually have to deal with far stricter rules uh, than, they, than they can do in other, uh, in other mediums. So let's take in the US, direct mail. So the mail that can be sent to people in, at their terrestrial address. Um, campaigns under the First Amendment in the United States can pretty much say whatever they want, and they can target on whatever basis they want using the vast amounts of data, thousands of data points on every member of the electorate. Um, and they're able to actually get back completely uh, identifiable information back if somebody takes a certain uh, action uh, in response to uh, in response to mail. They could track what that what those people did, when, etc. In the, in the platform space, however, that data becomes um, non-personally uh, identifiable, right? So when, when a campaign uploads a data file to Facebook, uh, it gets matched to Facebook profiles anywhere around 60 to 80 percent effectiveness, depending on the universe, et cetera. Um, and campaigns don't get back identifiable information um, uh, in terms of who saw that ad and how they responded to it. Um, so, so they have to play by rules, self-regulation, um, in the U.S. at least, um, that has been built up over time, um, and they have to play by commercial advertising rules. So in some ways, the practice of micro-targeting on Facebook and Google is, is, is cruder um, than it could be in other places. However, the medium really matters, right? Um, and this is what's important, is that because Facebook is so much of a context of how people live their everyday lives, and because political messages are interspersed with personal messages, social messages, entertainment messages, um, uh, the effects are likely different 
Um, and certainly inex inadvertent exposure is definitely different, right? So most people are sort of trained at this point to disregard their political mail. Um, however, it's not as easy to disregard a political ad that might appear in your feed next to something that your uncle posted, for instance, or something from a, a journalistic outlet. So I have an observation and a follow-up question, which is probably more to the room. But um, so the observation is some of this, it's not even so clear what's a political ad, right? So some of the voter suppression stuff um, was using kind of trolley posts about the Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement to, um, to produce various kinds of emotional whiplash in the electorate and you wouldn't even have that registered as a political ad in the first place and I could go post one tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's so when we're talking about political ads, sometimes I think it's important to remember that almost anything can be one. But then the question is, right, so the, the um, you keep talking about the US and I understand that because that's what you study, but, um, but since we can all read, right, we know that the political climate in many European countries is not that different than the political climate in the US, except yeah. so far we've probably elected the, you know, the worst specimen, but, um, but you know, the polarization and the viral circulation of, of um, outrageous material is everywhere. Um, and yet, in theory, you guys and your political parties can't do the kinds of easy micro-targeting, right, that US political parties can um, without violating the supposed data protection laws, or they can do it anyway, like, can someone explain this to me? Yeah, they can, it depends, it depends on how they get their data. Uh, because okay. it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a long story. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but the, if they collect their data in the correct ways, mm -hmm. they can, then we can micro-target uh, a whole lot like they can in the U.S. So then if that's the case, then the notion that data protection would, would prevent micro-targeting would seem to be not very correct. I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> yes. this is well, this is something up for debate. Yeah, sure. So I mean, of course, it the, the the caveat here is, it's uh, if the data is collected in the right, the correct way. You need you need explicit consent, and this is a very yeah. But, uh, so, like, I'm an ultra right wing person. Great, here's my data, so you can send me more crap. I mean, I just don't understand the effectiveness. Right, is all I'm saying. Well, I think you would never get the data sets or the size of the data sets mm -hmm. in the proper way. So in a way, if, if somebody has uh, data sets of virtually the entire voting population, mm -hmm. they probably did not uh, get it legally because mm -hmm. most of them would not have consented explicitly. But in theory, of course, it's possible. If I explicitly consent to micro-targeting by a particular political party, then they can do it. I mean, I think one, one important point of context, too, is that, you know, in, in the U.S., and I keep going back to this in part because that's my knowledge base, but as a jumping off point for other people to bring in their own regulatory context, et cetera, but, you know, it, it, look, micro-targeting in the United States is, is over 150, 160 years old. I mean, William Jennings Bryan, who ran for president um, three times and, and unsuccessful, uh, uh, unsuccessful, his... Um, uh, brother-in-law built an index card file of all the people who wrote him letters um, during his failed presidential campaigns, and, and it composed a quarter of a million names and their occupations, their hopes and fears, the things that they were interested in, and they were used um, to send out personalized mail to those people. So the question, and I don't know the, the EU context, but like a lot of what we see in the activism space is people will run petitions, um, they'll run, you know, the, all, the, all the different campaigns that you see, whether it's on Kickstarter or change.org, these places, they're, they're meant to generate lists and they're meant to generate data. Um, and, and a lot of what conservatives in particular perfected this in the U.S. in the, in the 70s and 80s is that they would run, you know, these, these campaigns to change 
um, to change a, a local thing or some high profile controversy, but it was all about generating names, names that could then be activated and called upon to do other stuff. So I think the, the problem, the scope of the problem is very difficult and challenging in part because as we create more rules, political actors will have incentives to try to work around them um, and build data in other ways that can be actionable for politics. If I can add something on that, let's also not uh, forget that actually people like to receive relevant information relevant to their life. So they are likely to consent more than perhaps the average person in this room is likely to do ever in his or her life. And then, uh, we, given you're talking about context, there's a lot about the US because, uh, well, Daniel, of course, is, is, uh, is an expert at that, but also because, in fact, you guys are very good at, um, you know, opening uh, new ways for us then on this side of the pond to follow off and, and not necessarily uh, for the good, but uh, context matters. and matters uh, also when we look at literacy and also we will look at uh, you know, the general dynamics within a liberal democracy. And I, I really want to tell you a story which uh, will probably resonate with the Italians in this room and probably is a bit different from what we're discussing here, but. Recently there's been, uh, so an Italian, let's say new political party has had its own elections to select a secretary. And no matter, you know, okay, in Italy there's not much of, uh, you know, the internet penetration is, is not exactly um, at the same level in, in other European countries and so on and so forth, but uh, the, the candidate that won, won because someone brought a number of people to vote for him, hiring buses. <laughs> So this is not, I mean, we're talking about a small group of 2,000 people to elect one individual. But uh, there's a lot of that still happening anyway. So what we are discussing anyway plays into a context which is uh, much more complex than that has to do uh, also with traditional canvassing in the US and uh, with uh, other more traditional old style um, tactics as well. And one of the comments of the person who organized the buses was, uh, yeah, this is not all about social media. Something else as well. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm allowed to share because I want to discuss with, with you too. Um, but I think Julie's question on whether data protection law is actually the right framework to, to access, I, I think that's, that's a very critical question, especially here for CPDP. And uh, in the previous um, um, uh, panel, Christina very uh, rightly corrected remark this is not the goal of data protection law to ensure fairness in elections or, or more fairness in relation of using data in, 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 uh, to persuade people. Um, and I also totally agree with her uh, reference to media law because media law has a very long tradition of dealing with opinion power in the media and, and using a platform to, to, to use that. But we also have another area of law which has a very long tradition of um, dealing with persuasion and drawing a borderline between legitimate persuasion and, 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 and uh, unlawful manipulation, which is um, advertising law, unfair commercial practices. Uh, because uh, don't f I think Daniel also made the point that a lot of these strategies, they come from the commercial sector. They are actually transferred one to one from uh, selling um, jewelry to selling parties. Um, and we do have a legal framework and a lot of um, um, thinking on how to deal fair with persuading people in the commercial sector and we have no comparable rules for political advertising. So I think this is another um, area that might need attention. So we, uh, we had one question from the audience and um, yeah, I see you raise your hand. Thank you, uh, Andrew Adams from Meiji University. Um, on this question of will we get regulation in this area and the fact that you're asking turkeys to vote for Christmas um, by uh, asking somebody who's won power using many of these techniques to, to try and regulate them, um, I wonder whether we're looking at the same thing we saw in many countries with freedom of information. So in the UK, for instance, campaigns requesting freedom of information law went on for 30 years. And finally, Tony Blair leading the natural party of opposition, if you'll pardon the phrase, at the time, came to power and passed this, and then was in power for 10 years, um, and has said in his memoirs that it was the biggest political mistake he ever made. Um, 
are we going to need 30 years <laughs> um, to do this? Or perhaps can we persuade people that they need regulation because they're not always going to be the ones winning? Julia? Yes, perhaps I can comment on that. I would be a bit more optimistic on this point. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, the European Parliament did vote uh, that micro-targeting should not be allowed in the context of elections. And even though a majority of uh, politicians voted for it, you will find, of course, uh, all of the political parties uh, trying to use targeting for their advantage in an election. But that's also because if one party voluntarily decides to stop it, they will be at a huge disadvantage. But I think politicians realize that it won't always be them who benefit from uh, these practices. And if they were banned for everybody, then of course that would uh, change the playing field. So I would be optimistic that it's possible to regulate in this way. I hope it won't take 30 years, but uh, I think there have also been uh, plenty of negative examples uh, in uh, how this has played out in elections, that there is a sensitivity to it being a problem. And it's not like everybody who sits in a parliament today says, well, I was elected because I was better at uh, using social media than everybody else. I see uh, another question uh, right here. Hi there, thanks for this uh, wonderful panel. It's a topic that's been bothering me for about 10 years now, so I'm very happy to see that. And I want to raise another part of the problem, which I consider um, of importance, is the problem that um, how do we actually prohibit or prevent manipulation from, from taking place? So we are always considering the actor of Facebook or Google uh, acting accord in accordance with the law, but given their um, enormous uh, uh, volume of data and the channels to address people, that could also be abused. Um, and how do we actually, what mechanisms do we have to prevent or to be more provocative? We may not even know that it already happened. So uh, I, as a member of our society, usually trust that the democratic decision was taken in a fair way, but currently I'm not sure anymore. So uh, based on that, my alliance with our system may then erode, and that is um, huge. Who dares? Um, so I guess this is a little abstract, but um, I wrote a paper recently called Turning Privacy Inside Out, and and there's a book coming out adapt, with a chapter adapted from it, and, and there's an argument that, um, that we have a paradigm shift that we need to make in the way that we regulate this kind of stuff. Um, and this goes to the freedom of information question too. <coughs> right? Freedom of information is actually pretty vague, right? So if we can all get access to the same data sets, we aren't all on an equal footing with regard to that. Um, you know, humans tend to look for either impermissible results, right? So why didn't you take that beheading video down? Or why didn't you take this terrorist speech down? Or impermissible reasons. Um, and if what you have is kind of impermissible or arguably impermissible algorithmic dynamics, right? You want to have circuit breakers that interrupt virality, right? Or you want to have um, freedom of information as to underlying logics or derived data or inferred data, um, right? Just say hypothetically. So, so there's like a whole new vernacular that we don't have yet, but that we really urgently need to have, right? that would enable us to kind of undertake this project of um, trying to limit some of these really harmful dynamics um, in, in a principled way, right? Which is also really important. Um, the, the, when the platforms come and say, oh, it's all censorship, they're not completely insane, they're self-interested, right? Um, so I think that's a, I mean, that's a project in kind of regulatory theory um, and it's also a project in systems design. 
The only thing that I would add um, with that, and, and I was thinking about this too when we were talking about um, micro-targeting, um, I think we need a clear societal-wide sort of discussion about, uh, I love that institution, um, uh, uh, about what we mean by manipulation, right? Um, what do we mean actually by micro-targeting, and specifically what are the harms associated with, with each? Um, and then we have to do so in a very clear way um, so that we can identify it and I think bring relevant stakeholders to the, to the table. Part of it is, is going to be a regulatory response. Part of it will be, it will be on practitioners and political leaders themselves to reinvent the way campaigns are, are run. I think that there's a strong ethical dimension here too that we need to really think about. Um, and I, uh, I think it, it will also be incumbent on platform companies as well to come to the table. As it stands now, I don't think that we're having those foundational level discussions in a very nuanced way, and I don't think that all the actors are, um, uh, are having it either. Um, and uh, I think it's important to have some of those foundational assumptions sort of teased out as a, a basis for further action. And if I may add something, while we have to work at all of this, which is uh, very important but also very long term, we can maybe turn your question on its head by asking what and if manipulation didn't really matter to citizens of the democratic process. So what antidotes to manipulation should we instill into the citizenry? It is, to be fair, another gigantic project, but we should really invest probably both as educators, as a lot of us are on this table, but also as, for example, a representative European institutions in uh, what we may call data literacy, the literacy associated with the digital more in general, but so that uh, we can understand, I mean, we can empower citizens to really discriminate a bit better into at least the visible part of the manipulation, because of course a lot of that needs regulation and needs a much broader discussion. But let's make citizens a little more equipped to interact with all of this. Uh, I see another question uh, right here in front. I think you should get up and walk to the mic. Yeah. Uh, hi. I'm not sure why there's still time left, but I was actually a bit surprised that we, you, didn't discuss the very simple question of what constitutes legitimate and illegitimate influence of the electorate, because I would feel that that is the starting question. And if we don't have an answer to that question, then how are we going to discuss the nitty-gritty details of the platforms we are discussing and the regulation? So maybe you could spend the next two minutes uh, delving into that question. That's a small question, yeah. yeah. Can you take us to there? Yeah, I mean, one element of that that I pointed to is that it matters less, I think, where the person who is communicating comes from. I mean, I don't think that outside interference in an election is per se illegitimate. I think there is a global debate on things going on. Um, but what is, I think, illegitimate is if a political party that in the end is only going to be able to vote one way presents completely different and contradictory messages to different parts of the electorate. Um, based on what they think they're, they're going to want to hear. So I think that's definitely something that we should be looking at, uh, I think, in this framework of advertising regulation. And the EU is taking some very small steps in the direction of changing also unfair commercial practices law to address some of the uh, internet phenomena, but we're kind of 10 years behind. At the moment, we are regulating unfair commercial practices in the area of uh, reviews on products and things like that, and I think we're just not there yet to roll it out in that area. But I would say it's, it, this would be an example of something that I would uh, consider illegitimate. Um. So it, it's a really good question, but I want to push back on it a little bit. There is a there is a difference, right, between your crazy uncle at holiday dinner um, being able to reach the 20 members of your extended family, and going and you know your crazy wow. uncle being able to go viral um, with his theory about how vaccines cause autism or whatever, and reach 400,000 people. Um, and 
we really need to have a conversation about that, and it's really hard because the founding ethos of the internet was, ooh, you know, scale is great, virality is great, crowdsourcing is great, um, bottom up everything is great. No, not really, right? It turns out um, that a lot of it is just nuts um, and, and harmful. Um, and so it would be really useful to be able to have a conversation about the trade-offs that get made when you choose either to, to um, maximize scale or, or not to. There really is a difference. What a est. Well, thank you, everybody.